introduce our first speaker, and I'm pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Ronald Morse, who is an emeritus professor from Virginia Tech University, and we're thrilled to have him uh, come up here with us today. Uh, Dr. Morse has extensive research and extension experience in um, cover crop uh, based uh, conservation farming systems for it, particularly small scale uh, vegetable production. So he's going to talk with us about fitting cover crops into vegetable rotations, which uh, we know can be a whole other complex type of system other than a, besides a grain system. So come on up, Dr. Morse. I actually am writing a manual on cover crops. And so what I'm going to talk to you today is a brief introduction to chapter five of this manual. And in this, out, in this handout here, uh, there's an outline of what the different chapters will entail. So I'm not here to promote this manual, but uh, it's something that uh, I've given a lot of talks and a lot of people have asked, where can I get this written? So finally, I've decided to go ahead and, 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 and write a manual, hopefully within uh, a year, year and a half, it'll, it'll be available. Uh, I first want to talk a little bit about this, this title, the uh, cover crop based production. I've been at Virginia Tech for over 40 years, and um, about 30 of that have, have been using cover crops as a, as a pre-crop to growing vegetable crops. And so when I say cover crop based, that's exactly what I've done for all these years. I grow a cover crop followed by a, a particular vegetable crop. So that's why the title. Uh, this is an example of a, of a cover crop that would be used for subsequent planting of uh, spring vegetables like uh, Irish potatoes or le lettuce, or onions. And in this system, I use a, about a, a, around a six to six and a half feet, f feet bed. And it, each bed has two sections. So I'm going to talk for 35 minutes, and so I'm going to use these sections often. So let's learn right now what they are. The center section I call grow zones because after, after the uh, cover crop will come a vegetable crop. Here in the, in the inter areas, I call uh, traffic zones because that's where you, know, you would walk or you take a tractor if you can do, do things with a tractor. So get used to this. And I'll show later how I, get, how I do this with a cedar to make it make, always have these two, two components. This way I have um, a great deal of, of biodiversity and then in here, in the, where I grow the, the, uh, the little legume or a cover crop like, like this one, uh, I'll, I sometimes I'll have a cocktail. So I could have three or four in here where I'm going to grow the vegetable crop. And in here will be almost always grass cover crops because they, re they deter weeds and they make a great uh, system to complement then growing the vegetables. Fifteen years ago, um, I, I applied for organic no-till research grants. Up to that point, I'd been doing it for many years, but uh, there wasn't hardly any money available. Uh, about that same time, I retired. Now, that was in theory. I really did not, not retire. I just took a break and did something else. Well, lo and behold, about the turn of the century, there was a lot of money, well, some money at least, available in organic no-till. And I had a lot of experience in that area. I'd been doing it for about 20 years. And so when I applied for grants, I applied for four grants thinking maybe I would get one of them. Guess how many I got? I got all four of them. So. That's about the time I was, uh, I was going to retire, so obviously I didn't retire. But I really uh, found out basically two things. You can grow organic no-till vegetables. However, it's very difficult. If, you, if anyone here is interested in organic no-till, 
basically what I did that was uh, very wise on my part. Before I ever started doing organic no-till, I spent two years to, to do two things. To increase the organic matter in my, in my grow zones. And also, uh, I, I, I did several things to, to uh, benefit the, the, the loss of weeds. In other words, I got rid of the weed seed bank. So after two years of intensive cover cropping, never letting anything go to seed, my weed seed bank had significantly been lowered. Now, only in Hollywood would, would, can I say that it was totally gone. But then when I started my organic no-till research uh, at the turn of the century, I was very successful. And we had excellent crops with, with minimum weed problems. The reason I was successful, other than I got rid of a lot of the weeds before I started, I, I grew high biomass cover crops. I'm not talking about a ton per acre. I'm talking about three to four tons per acre of dry matter. So that allowed me to, to not only grow a legume crop, or in this case, the radish that would soak up the nitrogen from the previous crop, I also had weed control because of the very dense uh, uh, grass cover crops here in the, in the alleyways. This is another, and this is sun hemp and pearl millet. And uh, as you can see, the, how thick these cover crops are. I, I want to <coughs> stop and pause a minute. When I <coughs> first started doing this, I had a lot of interest in taking my no-till transplanter that I developed around and a lot of county agents wanted me to come to their their farms or to their uh, farmers uh, that they dealt with and um, so they said i will grow a cover crop and have it all ready if you'll come and plant the, these vegetable crops in a, in a no-till situation so i said okay and i told them exactly what to do i said you got to plant high density cover crops, make sure you get a good stand. 80% of the time, guess what I found? When, when I went to visit that farm, anticipating having the very high residue cover crops that I was used to, it was awful. It was, instead of three tons per acre, it was a half ton per acre. And so that, I was really, really disappointed. And so at this point, and you'll see in my talk as I proceed through it, I cannot in all honesty recommend organic no-till. And, and I can't recommend even no-till in a lot of situations unless they use cover crops according to the, the, the high, high density uh, residues that, that I've been used to. Let's, let's define soil health. Growers should consider off-season production of cover crops of equal importance as in-season production of cash crops. This may sound like it's uh, a little bit too much, but that's basically what I did. I spent a great deal of effort, even at times I would irrigate, to make sure I had a good stand. And I want to define soil health, uh, at least according to what I believe. Soil health, I'm pushing the wrong button here. So, soil capacities that consistently produce high crop yields using few off form in inputs with little or no harm to the environment. And that's what I tried to do for many years at Virginia Tech and we were very successful. Maintaining soil health. Basically, soil health is dynamic. It can be managed. That's the good thing about soil health. Soil health declines during production of grass crops. Soil health is restored when cover crops are, are grown. For example, here is a, I always use cover, I always use a formscapes to attract beneficial insects. And here was, was a, a squash and it did a very good job. This is a, another experiment where we had uh, peppers and here in the traffic zones, this was rye. Um, 
But what happened if we really analyze after a year in these, traffic, in these grow zones, the soil health would, would decline. And so after a while, I totally realized that I had to have cover crops following the, the cash crops. And that way, I, I, I was actually to restore it each time and even in, in enhance it. The role of conservation in agriculture. People have, have constantly called me and asked me to give a talk on no-till because that's where I made my reputation. And I said, I will come, but I won't talk on no-till. I'll talk about conservation agriculture. And here's why. CA is a philosophy which, excuse me, I keep doing this. CA is a philosophy with specific objectives and practices designed to sustain and promote soil health. Basically, conservation agriculture has three different points. Minimize soil disturbance. So there's your no-till system, or reduced till. But in addition to that, you maximize year-round coverage and then maximize farm diversity. That's why the cover crop system was fantastic and really fall, fell into the area not of, of conservation tillage only, but of conservation agriculture. Methods of establishing cover crops. I've done a, uh, I've done a lot of different things and, and, a lot, and grew a lot of cover crops in different ways, but without a doubt, seed drills function best to distribute different soil or mixed cocktail <coughs> cover crops in adjacent zones. I've done drop seeding, I've done all kinds of things, but without a doubt, without a doubt, seed drills are the best. And this is an example of the, the, the seed drill that I used. This is a Thai seeder. It has 10 different rows. This is about a six foot area here. Again, this is, where, this is here where the, the legume cover cross would be for the grow zones and on the edge it would be the grass for the the weed control. And so basically, with this system, I actually could plant 10 different cover crops at the same time. And even each one with a, with a cocktail. So you can't do that any other way. You have to have a seed drill to make that work. So basically, again, to summarize, uh, we have grow zones and traffic zones. And these are the different spacings and, uh, and, and characteristics of those. Now this is what I, again what I mean. This is a, this is a red clover planted in the grow zones with with rye planted in the traffic zones. Here's a shot a little bit later. As you can see, the the um, red clover is filling in and makes a real good cover crop. This is when I was doing organic, so it really paid off in terms of nitrogen production. Now uh, what I want to do to finish up, I want to talk about cover crop cash crop sequences. No two cover crops are alike. Cover crops are like people. They're, they're, they're all different. Long-term planning is important to grow the best cover crop for each type of cash crop, spring, summer, and fall. We'll demonstrate that now. Let's grow some, some spring vegetables. For example, like onion, pea, Irish potato. For that, without a doubt, the best system is, is to grow winter-killed summer cover crops. And, and the examples would be bersine clover, forage radish. If you're going to have a, a, a system in the grow zone area that is, in, that is fine enough in terms of taking care of the soil in the correct way, the, the uh, the uh, winter kill cover crops are the best way to go. And this again is the example showing the system. Now what's neat about this, this was taken probably in October. This was, they were seeded in August. Now this was in the following spring. So we, we got the, the rye growing here for weed control. No, this was for organic. And then the, the uh, forage radish dies, dies and leaves this real nice seed bed. Now you could actually seed in there directly, but we would generally take a rototiller and shallow till it. And so here we have a system where we could grow potatoes or, or onions, whatever, 
and then we had weed control in, in the, uh, in the uh, traffic zone. So that worked really well. I could show 10 different, different types of things, but yes. Yes. Uh, I'm glad someone had enough nerve to ask that, a question. I was going to say that I'd prefer to have the questions during the lecture. Uh, yeah, we have done a lot with perennials. And in fact, in, in my opinion, the best system is where you do use perennials and only grow vegetable crops every other year. Uh, there are many vegetable growers that, that do this and are very successful at it. So I, I like the perennials very much. Now let's grow uh, summer vegetable crops like tomato or pumpkin. Winter cover crops are best. Examples, crimson clover and barley, hairy vetch and rye, Austrian winter pea and triticale. This is not all, but this is an example. I've used everything I sh I've shown you and talk about I've, I've done. And it works really well. Uh, this is one of my favorite um, slides. I have often told my wife that I'd like to take this and put it in the living room. I think it's so pretty. She was not very impressed, but... Uh... <laughs> but anyway, this is no-till pumpkins. Now, this is one thing that's taken off. Uh, we've done, we've been instrumental in making this happen, but it's, it's caught all, all over the East Coast no-till pumpkins are being grown. And so you see here, this is a, a of course, a pumpkin, and this was a, about a four-ton dry matter uh, rye, cereal rye, which we rolled and then we planted. And as you can see, maybe up close, some people can see a weed or two, but this was, or, this was done basically organic, and we didn't have weed problems at all. So it can be done, but you have to start with a very high residue system. Pumpkins are great because if you can get them to germinate uh, in, in a week, and generally they will, they spread out really f fast and cover the soil. So with pumpkins, if you can keep the weeds down for five to six weeks, you're home free. And uh, we found this very successful, uh, organic or inorganic. Uh, this, is, this is another one, again, uh, we always had farbscapes everywhere to uh, attract beneficial insects. And this was uh, summer squash. When I started doing these experiments, this was organic, so I couldn't use chemicals. Uh, and I was very, very nervous. I thought, I thought this squash is going to be eaten alive by the time I wanted to harvest squash. We harvested 10 times, and we got 33 thousand pounds to the acre and would had very few insects. Why? We had excellent farmscapes. And this is this is pepper. Uh, the, the pepper now this this is on um, this is not no-till. This was with, with, with plastic. Okay now fall cover crops. Probably of all uh, I've had more success with, with fall cover crops. Um, cabbage and broccoli. Summer cover crops are best. Cowpea uh, or, or soybean, foxtail millet, or all, all the kinds of millet, sun hemp, sun hemp sorghum sudan grass, seeded in, in uh, May or June. In, in our area, we generally would plant our cover crops, uh, the, uh, summer cover crops uh, that, that early so that we could get their, these crops planted at least by the first week or second week at the latest in August. So if you plant these cover crops in May, you can have them standing this, this tall, and it works really well. By the way, again, if you have any questions as I proceed, go ahead. Now I will show you how this is done. Um, this, this is, of course, here's your farmscape. And this is actually a forage soybean, and that's a probably about four feet high. And then in the, this is in the grow zones, and the traffic zones is foxtail millet. And as you can see, if you walk in there, you don't see weeds growing on that cover crop. It is dense. And so 
once we take care of things, uh, we, we flail mode it and let it uh, die down to make sure that uh, we did have a, a good kill. And then this is the no-till transplanter that we invented many years ago. Uh, for some of you who have never seen, seen this, it has basically three, three components. Uh, you, well, maybe four components. You have a coulter and shank here that uh, cuts the, the residues and then loosens the soil. Here is a water tank to, to when you put your uh, transplants to make them make sure that they get off to a good start. This is a fertilizer hopper that places uh, the fertilizer right down in the row. And then this is, uh, as you might recognize, this is to hold a roll of, t of ta tape. And so that tape then would lay in the row. And so we had a, a real neat system. We could plant organically uh, or chemically, depending on what you wanted to do. As you can see, here's the transplants. Now here's what it, where, what it looked later. This is, a, uh, excuse me, this is a typical farmscape that we had. And, um, and this was the broccoli, and this, this is what it looked like. Now, you might say, oh, that was the only good head in the patch. Not true. Uh, the, the heads averaged over a pound, in fact, a pound and about two <coughs> ounces, and we had 12,000 pounds to the acre, uh, and this was organic. And so the point is it can be done, but you have to pay strict attention to the ABCs of doing it. And it starts with high density, high biomass cover crops. Cover crop cash crop sequences. I prefer strongly wide zone till systems. The reason is I've been so disappointed. A lot of people have had trouble growing organic. I mean, excuse, excuse me, doing the no-till. So I'll skip that because I want to show how we do this. This, this is a... Uh, a uh, rototiller 38 inches wide and so we're rototilling in here and then we lay plastic now this is a different field but we lay plastic in that one and this one also and then we grow broccoli and this is on, on plastic and this was a this whole field was in um, a red clover for two years that was getting to your perennials and so we just tilled in in the grow zones and let the red clover grow in the traffic zones. And again, this is one of my favorite pictures. We, we had a fantastic crop and we did not have a lot of problems with, with weeds. Could you describe your soils and the soil nutrition? The soils that we use is a, are a silt loam, hater silt loam. And so it is a very uh, good soil in terms of natural fertility. And, and a thing that to, to point out, these beds had been there for several years. And so for several years, up to maybe eight or 10 years, those beds had not been disturbed. This was permanent control traffic systems. And so over time, the fertility in those beds were, was really high. Could you describe what you, what you did in your farmscaping? Uh -huh. um, oh boy. <laughs> I got. How much time do I have? Uh, probably about seven more minutes. Oh, so. good for me. Yeah. All right. <laughs> how we got started with farmscapes is uh, as I applied for grants in organic no-till, I realized I had to have help. <laughs> I had to have help from, brother, from Mother Nature. And so what we did, we studied farmscapes. And, you know, you can buy all kinds of mixture of farmscapes. And we looked at the seeds. Some of them were huge and some of them were microscopic. You could hardly see them. And I said, what depth am I going to plant these? And so I scratched it. And I made up my own system. And I had seven different rows all seeded by hand. Now, uh, now yeah, I could have done it with my seeder, but in this case, I seeded by hand. I have a publication. If you want to write me, I'll send you a publication on exactly what we did. And uh, they were very successful. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I started organic no-till as a pessimist. I thought, I'll do this because I can get money to do it. Really, that's why I did it. But I, I 
I, I have realized that if it's done right, you can do organic no-till. And the farmscape is the key. And, and, and you need to establish the farmscape sometimes in advance. Mine was a, mine, some of mine were annuals, but the best ones were perennials. That they'll stay there year after year because these beds were in the same place too. Because everything was permanent control bed systems. So if you, uh, so if you want to write me, I'll, I'll, I'll send that. Just wondering, how did you make out getting your plastic up off the fields? For me, that's a, a big issue. I, I haven't found a good way of getting plastic up. Yeah, I was afraid someone's going to ask that question. <laughs> what we did, we developed with the, with the uh, system. Let's see if I can go back. This is a, I call it a no-till plastic laying machine. And it, it, it is very different because you, the, what, what it is is a coulter and shank, and then these wheels push it straight down. So to get it out, I had to come in with a blade coming from an angle and that, would, that would come in here and lift that up. And it, it worked all right, but that's, that's something that Ron Morris needs to work on because I realized that that was a... Because I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to destroy that bed. I spent years keeping that bed like it, like it is. So the way we did it with a single knife, it dis, and as you go along, it just lifted it out. Um, it wasn't perfect. That's something I need to do better. But it, it did work, and that's how I did it. Now, when do you lifted that up? Did it the plastic? Did it roll up? Or did no, I had to come back and, and then just drag it. And I could have done it probably hooking it onto a tractor at that point. Uh, I hear you're saying that you maintain the same bed permanently in some other systems. I've seen the French intensive method of flipping the beds back and forth. Could you just mention a little bit why you're keeping them in permanent beds and not alternating? I, I like the permanent bed system. First of all, this is a phenomenon. There's, uh, there's a whole... In Australia, every two years they have a week of uh, meetings on, on permanent control bed systems, and there's a lot of interest in it. The reason is, in my, if I keep my beds in one place, and that means my tra I don't till, or if, I, if it is, I, it's just till shallow. So without tillage and me pumping in organic matter, also I had I invented a a uh, compost applicator that would put compost just in the in the grow zones so with that system i was building up organic matter which meant means soil health and so if i was tearing that down each time and starting over i'm just losing the organic matter so it's a way to keep my organic there and being built up okay let me let me finish this because i know my time's about up i like no-till that's my that has been my life but until you can do it right, this, this really works, this, uh, the other works well, the, the zone till system. But if you can do it, here's how you, what you have to do. Produce uniform high residue cover crops. Kill cover crops leaving a uniform dense mulch. Establish cash, cash crops by hand or use no-till transplanters or seeders. And manage weeds using high residue mulch and or herbicides. That's what I did when I was successful. When I got away from those four points, I was not successful. It's just that simple. I, I saw your videos on YouTube. I can't remember if you used uh, a shank and a fertilizer opener on one of your units. On my transplanter? On your transplanter. Because um, I'm looking at doing a single row uh, to, do, to go into rolled rye and was wondering if it would be better to use a, a wavy coulter followed by a shank. What I, what I used and, 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 and seated right here on my left is Steve Groff. And he used my transplanter for many years, and then he actually improved on it. And that's uh, okay. We're still friends, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> what I did is that you start with a straight colder. Some people like wavy colders. I think a straight colder cuts, followed by a shank. And the shank would loosen the soil about 10 inches deep. Oh, depending on how deep you wanted to run the shank. And, and so if it was done right, basically all you got is a loosened soil and, and, and a slit about four inches wide. 
And so then you can come by hand or with my transplanter and put the, put the transplant right down in that area. Can you leave the shoe? The, the shoe stays on? And, oh, and the shoe, to make it work, I had to put a, a metal, two discs in front of the shoe, I'm sorry. So that the shoe then, with these two, two discs, would run right in that narrow slot that had been sliced and, and, and loosened. And when I did that, it, it was successful. The first transplanter I built, it went 50 yards and broke. And I, and I said, either, either you've got to get a different profession or you've got to do it better. So I went back to the shop and I made a very, very heavy duty machine. And also on the shank, I had it so it would trip. So if it hit a rock or an obstacle, it would, instead of breaking something, it just flip up. So when I went to this heavy duty system with a colder and a shank, and then, then um, uh, two, two discs uh, in front of the shoe, it worked.